So uh, without, my, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Jevin West. Jevin is an assistant professor in the Information School at the University of Washington, and he is co-founder of the Data Lab. Broadly, he works in the area of data science and data reasoning. With his colleague, Carl Bergstrom, he developed a new course, Calling BS in the Age of Big Data. His core research asks questions about the origins of scientific disciplines, the biases within science that drive these disciplines, and the impact the current publication system has on the health of science. To explore these questions, he develops machine learning techniques for mining scientific text, citations, and figures. Example projects include eigenfactor.org, visiometric.org, and more details on his research and teaching can be found at jevinwest.org. Please join me in welcoming Jevin West to the University of Iowa. Sarah? No, okay. Use the oh, great. Okay, I should put that on. Sorry. So, so thank you all for coming in. From what I understand, talking to some of you this morning, you guys haven't even started yet, which is crazy because we started um, on July or January 4th. And um, for you to come in before, I, I really appreciate it. And I want to thank Sarah for organizing this event. I think it's a really cool event and maybe a model for our libraries to have once a year, too, something like this. Um, and thanks, uh, yeah, thank, thanks to all of you for helping us get it as well. So a couple quick things before I get started. First, I want to uh, uh, sort of uh, point out my colleague, Carl Bergstrom, who's a, uh, a professor also at the University of Washington in the Department of Biology, and he's definitely been my co-conspirator in this project. And also, because calling bullshit is kind of a heavy term in the morning, I want to make sure that you all know that we, I also, we also created a callingbull.org, uh, so you can just get rid of this, and uh, the .org, I wrote a script and pulled out all of the swear words in it. And that was for good reason, not just to sort of get rid of that, but we're working a lot with high school um, teachers around the country um, to use this kind of material in their classroom, and we know that, you know, that you know, the, it's, it's much more palatable without that. So you can do that. And also, as I was mentioning to a few just in the front seats here, all this material is available if you want to teach a version of the uh, course yourself. For all of our material, we want to make it available to other universities to customize it in their own way. Please use it. The only thing we ask is just let us know so that we can, we can link to it um, and then we can let our administrators know so they continue to let us teach the class. OK, all right, so lots of, when you, when you study BS studies, if there's such a thing, there's lots of material to, to go over. And I, of course, can't go through 40 hours of lectures in this whole class. I wanted to sample sort of, um, sort of the story that, that, uh, behind uh, what we're doing um, and also sort of talk about some of the sort of main points that we're trying to get across, across in the class. Now, we start sort of this class uh, um, with just this idea that everyone already knows, this is something we all know, we really are drowning in BS. It's everywhere. And of course, if we look to politics, that's low-hanging fruit. So we don't spend a ton of time uh, talking a lot about the politics, but we know that politicians are unconstrained by facts. The thing that concerns me more, though, since I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of science, and, and I think it can do a lot for society. Um, I study, and, and as does Carl, um, a lot of the things uh, that are going uh, wrong with the scholarly communication system um, is also sort of its own form of BS. And even at um, uh, the higher ed education institutions, which we all live at, we sort of sometimes are complicit in this. Um, you know, we have, you know, we reward students for starting their essay at 2 o'clock in the morning and somehow BSing us into good grades. So, but of course, I think we're doing better, more good things than bad things. I live um, sort of in sort of the second Silicon Valley, and I'm always hearing, hearing these elevator pitches of startup culture sort of does this. Of course, we've been seeing this forever in marketing, but it, it used to be, you know, a generation ago, advertisers fed us BS just straight up. And now it's this irony. Um, trick that, that marketers use. And it's just everywhere. It sort of infuses us. We don't even know what's there. And, and I make fun of my uh, colleagues in administration that, they, that we're, and I'm a part of that too, um, that we're just a sophisticated, it's a sophisticated exercise in the combinatorial reassembly 
of BS. Um, and of course, the saddest thing of all this is that most Americans um, spend a lot of time on Facebook doing what? Mostly spreading BS. So Carl and I were just, just decided, actually several years ago, but it sort of came to culmination earlier in 2017, that this was enough. And we wanted to bring um, things that we, we um, have been trained over many, many years, actually multiple decades now in science, reviewing papers, reviewing reports, you know, living in this world of digital media. Could we bring this to our students and teach this? Because we thought nothing is more important um, to teach a student than to critically reason. And in our case, our specialty is in data reasoning. So when people say, how is this different than the classes in philosophy and the humanities? Because they've been doing this for centuries. Um, and we, of course, build a upon that. I think one of the possibly distinguishing qualities of at least our, our, our sort of emphasis is that we have a focus on data. Data is everywhere. Um, it's in every aspect of our life. It sort of has enveloped all areas of industry, academia, government. And we want to help students, both young and old, people across the industry, how to reason with graphs and statistics without having a PhD in statistics or computer science. So let me give you some examples. I mean, this is, this is a, uh, a current type, the type of meme that passes around the internet all the time. So I'm in Seattle, and there's been this big discussion about Amazon's second headquarters. So this meme was spreading around. It was seen by hundreds of thousands of people. And it had this nice little map here comparing the Amazon warehouse offices, the square area that they encompass, if you take all those warehouses and the footprint they have in uh, the state of Washington and the comparison to the Amazon rainforest. And they have nice numbers here, you know, you have your square miles. And this passed around and people, you know, this just sort of went along with the story about Amazon's second headquarters. But does anyone, you think this is true? <laughs> I, mean, I could give you a lot, we have hundreds of memes we give in classes and we do these kinds of questions. Now this one is just, of course, patently false. It's so, it's so false that it's, it's, it's just not even worth really discussing why it's false. But these are the kinds of examples that we see passed around, and then it, as, as, you know, as more things are being thrown at us from day to day, we don't take time to sort of think through these things. So, you know, but, but here's the, pro the, the thing with these memes, and, and most of the falsehoods and BS that travels around the internet nowadays, most of it, I consider a minor annoyance. It's kind of annoying that these falsehoods are flying around, and there, some of them are actually kind of funny, and you can talk about them over lunch or over dinner, and most of the time, we do a lot of tests, and we're working with other groups to do tests on what students sort of, what they're good at detecting, what are they good at refuting, and what are they not good at refuting. I actually, after working on this, now for some time, I'm actually quite confident that students are pretty good at calling BS sort of in sort of the mean, the mean kind of BS. But it's the, it's the data stuff that I think they really struggle with. But given the minor annoyance, this is not what I'm worried about. This isn't what that sort of spurred Carl and I to build this class. It was things like this that was spreading around the internet. So this was a news story by AWD News that claimed that Israel was threatening Pakistan. So if you read the headline here, it says, if Pakistan sends ground troops into Syria on any pretext, we will destroy this country with a nuclear attack. Now I show a student something like this, and, and most of the time, thank goodness, they go, well, that sounds ridiculous. But it wasn't ridiculous enough, and it wasn't refuted. And by the way, I should say, this was fake news. It was taken down. If you go to the site now, it's a 404 error. It doesn't exist. It's un indisputably false. No one argues that this was a true story. Even the creators of a lot of these stories come out and say, yeah, I created it. They got me maybe a lot of money you know, with advertisements, because there's a strong incentive beyond just the propaganda to create these kinds of news stories. But it wasn't taken down soon enough. Here's what the defense minister of Pakistan tweeted out earlier this last year, or earlier in, um, uh, in or late 2016. All you need to go here, read here is that Israel forgets that Pakistan is a nuclear state too. That's pretty scary when a leader of a major company or a, com a, a country with weapons of mass destruction 
are making decisions and putting out threats based on fake news. Now, he responded and, re and they realized that it was a fake news items. But this, this is stuff's real. It's, this isn't just minor annoyances. And so I think we do need to, I think we are at a time in our history, in human history, where falsehoods, which have been around forever, and there's been yellow journalism and all the kinds of tabloidism that we see today even at a higher degree. It's been around, but it's at a degree that now democracy is at stake and world preservation even is at stake. So I think it's a very serious thing. And I, and I don't think that's it's being taken lightly anymore. I think it's now being taken serious by the general population. One of the quotes that really stuck with Carl and I sort of during this time period when we were sort of pulling all this material that we'd put together for a couple of years before, because for a couple of years we just kept sending things back and forth to each other late at night after we'd been done doing our task. I sent Carl an email and I say, did you see this? In, and these were in science papers, nature, proceedings in the National Academy of Science. There, we were seeing things in our science world and of course we saw things in the real world as well. So in response to this, we decided to create this course. We released it in January of last year. And I remember pushing to the GitHub repository to push to the site and publish it for the first time, January 11th, and I went to bed that night, and both Carl and I thought, well, I hope some of our friends think it's cool because we spent this time putting this together. We felt really passionate about it. That's what we really were carried, and it, and it really took off. And then just within seven hours, or I needed only seven hours of sleep, but in, in the time that I went up and woke up, my inbox was, we had thousands, tens of thousands of people from all over the world had visited the website, my email box was fuller than it's ever been, I'm still trying to clean out and try to respond to people. Um, it just, it, the, the response w was amazing and we, we ended up creating the class at the university um, and our, our um, the, the university for the most, uh, for uh, actually all parts has been really supportive of allowing us to make this content really available to teach this course. There's still uh, there's still some questions about if we can use it in the course catalog, the word, but we've we've worked with them a little bit. Uh, but we were, were I mean there, there we did a lot of thought. We didn't just uh, put up the name through some fickle sort of uh, decision making. We really thought a lot about it. Uh, and, you know you know on one side. One reason is that if we uh, said, you know, we titled the course critical reason or sort of yeah, critical reasoning and statistical inference or something, students would have just passed by it. Um, but we but we also it wasn't just it wasn't just the marketing side of it, too. We felt that it conveyed in English language the word bullshit really carries um, some a weight that, that no other synonym of it can. And so we just wanted to use it as a way of conveying our frustration. We may change it, sort of the core of our course though is data reasoning. It's not necessarily um, uh, necessarily have to really do it yet. So we do have a syllabus, we're adding content all the time. Like I said, feel free to really reach out to us if you want to use it, we'll help you get material together. We want you using it. Um, and, and you know, like I said, the only thing we ask is just let us know that you're they're using it. Um, you know, it's been written up in many different places and we've had a chance to use this as a platform to go reach out to other parts of the world. And um, I've been traveling around to places that um, have, have a much bigger problem than even the US on, on misinformation. Been working with researchers, working a lot with high school teachers now. Um, it's now, uh, we've been contacted uh, by, you know, the, the list is even growing, the, uh, by more than 60 universities across the country and the world to use um, the, uh, this content. So we're using this, again, as a, as a way to work together, not because it's not just us. People have other ways of conveying this. They have other ways they want to customize. So this is, this is exciting for us and um, we'll hopefully continue to utilize the momentum that um, this sort of the sort of response to misinformation is having, not just in our class, but all the good work that's that's going on. Um, I, I just realized, I don't know if my mic is on, but you guys, I, I just, because I know you wanted to record it, and I feel really bad. There you go. Okay, oh wow, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> so sorry to the video. Um, okay, so let me just kind of summarize the type of BS, though, that we're seeing all over. We sort of, we see kind of two kinds of BS. There's old school BS, which I consider this old school BS. This is the type of thing you see all the time. This is an example of it. So our collective mission is to refunctionalize customer-driven solutions for leveraging underutilized portfolio opportunities. Whatever that's supposed to mean, but it, it does to some venture capitalists 
or it does to investors. But the thing is, we're really, really good, I think, um, over you know, many, many you know, centuries on being able to detect this kind of BS. But it's this new, sky, new school kind of BS that I think we struggle with as a population. And we're seeing more of it used in the news. We're seeing it, of course, in science. We're seeing it everywhere. And so our goal of the class is to try to help people respond to this kind of BS. So while short of statistical significance after Bonferroni corrections, our results underscore clinically important effect size, blah, 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 blah. And people just accept that. And part of it's because we don't think we have the uh, sort of armory to sort of combat this. And that's what we want to do with this class. So sort of our, one of our central philosophies um, is this idea that uh, you know, there is this black box. This is the algorithms, the statistics, um, the, um, the, the, the sort of machine learning algorithms, whatever they are. There's this black box. But the black box requires data to be inputted to it. And there's output from these black boxes. And then there's this time where we interpret the data. And our sort of, our philosophy, our teaching philosophy, is that we can help people. They don't need to know anything about the black box if they focus on the data input and the data output and the interpretation of that data, they can call BS on this kind of stuff without having any advanced degree or even advanced training in statistics. Now, of course, it helps to have some knowledge of the black box, but I think we can, we can, teach, we can teach students um, how to respond to this kind of stuff. Now, I should say now, although the focus is data reasoning, it's data, data is sort of the core of the kind of BS that we're after. Um, we, do, uh, we do talk about sort of the social implications. We talk about the sort of media environments. We talk about fake news, because students really want to talk about fake news, although I don't consider myself an ex expert in fake news. But I do um, have done readings uh, over a, a lot of readings and met with a lot of people and gone to conferences. So I, I at least have some understanding of it. But our focus is this. So, so if you sort of allow, if you buy this just for a second, I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. So earlier this year, there was a paper published by a group out of Shanghai University. And the title of the, um, the paper was Automated Inference on Criminality Using Face Images. Just the title itself should be a little bit scary. So I can automatically infer, using the methods purported in this paper, on whether someone is a criminal by just looking at their face images. Now, you would think that this would just sort of be pushed to the side and no one would pay attention. But this was put on the archive, which was one of the, pre, one of the main preprint archives. And it did get a lot of attention. And it, and it certainly got Carl and I's attention when we looked at it for the first time. The, the, the scary thing is this immediately harkens back to much of the same kind of work that was being done by Cesar Lombroso, who was sort of one of the fathers of criminology. And he did do some, he did do good work in the area of criminology, except for some of these areas that were sort of underlain with racism. And, and that was looking at uh, basically this idea of phrenology and morphometrics, this idea that you could look at an individual face and tell immediately if they have, if they're going to be a criminal or are a criminal or have these criminal underpinnings. And so it's scary when I start seeing papers being published using the newest and greatest machine learning algorithms. Now, as I go through this example, I will not show one algorithm. I might mention an algorithm just to say that there, there are algorithms. But let's see if we can debunk this paper without looking at any of the fancy algorithms. And if you look at the paper, they use random forests and ensemble methods, all the sort of typical things you'd see in a machine learning paper. But let's look at the data input. So the data input here is, um, are uh, facial images from criminals and non-criminals. So they were able to get IDs, government IDs, for individuals that were convicted of crimes. They then also got pictures of individuals from sort of, uh, you know, Advertise you know, like LinkedIn. I call it linked out because in China they don't have LinkedIn. Just so I, I'm clear here, but it's like these kinds of um, sort of business advertising, um, resume building kind of websites, social media sites like LinkedIn. They took these images. They they talk a lot about how they normalize these images. Didn't use people with tattoos. Uh, they sort of squared the faces the same. 
And then they threw a bunch of machine learning algorithms at it. And what they claim here, and I, I need to read this. I know it's a long text, but it's so important. It's sort of core to one of my biggest pet peeves in my field of data science. So I need to read it. It says, unlike a human examiner judge, a computer vision algorithm of a, or classifier has absolutely no subjective baggages, having no emotions, no biases whatsoever due to past experience, race, religion, political doctrine, gender, age, etc., no mental fatigue, no preconditioning of a bad sleep or meal. The automated inference on criminality eliminates the variable of meta-accuracy, the competence of the human judge examiner altogether. So what do you say? Yeah. Yeah. I have to use the actual word here because of uh, how wrong this very is. And not, algorithms are only, the, the, the sort of results of these are only as good as the data input. As we say in, in, this, in this field, garbage in, garbage out. And our data that lives on the internet or lives in these digital archives are laden with the biases that we have as humans. In fact, it's even worse with algorithms, at least at this point, although there's a lot of great work, work in this area of algorithmic bias. But they're just, they're, they're, they're filled with biases, worse than even humans themselves probably, once you sort of give them all this data that has these, um, uh, these kinds of problems. But let's get to their, uh, again, I'm not showing their algorithm. All I'm going to show you is what they found now. So what they found that if you run these two different images and, and, and you, you label those that are criminals and non-criminals and then you then test random images, um, what, it's, what they claimed is that they could predict whether an image was a criminal or not and that they found that criminals have a smaller angle, theta, larger curvature, um, right here near the uh, mouth. So if they looked at the angle between the nose and the lips, well, they found this gave uh, uh, the sort of giveaway to it. If you find this um, angle here and this sort of curvature on this part of the mouth, I think maybe you guys are starting to see what might be happening here. Um, there's this discriminating feature. And this feature, just as a giveaway, be careful, don't go in the bathroom. Uh, I mean, you can go in the bathroom and check on whether you have it. So if you're a criminal or not, you better start leaving um, quickly. But no, if you look here, as you can see, the difference is where it was looking, basically the distinguishing quality was smiles. So what they had done, and what's just kind of cool, they had developed a smile detector rather than a criminal detection, which is actually uh, pretty good, but although that technology was developed about 10 years ago, and we have it all in our cameras, because it's a facial recognition, and you can identify uh, smiling. But they didn't, you know, I claim that they're, if you look at their criminal prototypes here, and you look at their non-criminal, you'll see that there's quite a difference. And, and by the way, other people noted other things. These individuals from the original images had white collars, and there was other kinds of things in those images that distinguishes. Like when you go and take your driver's license picture, or you go, yeah, you go to the DMV, or you go to the, any of these places where you have to take like your student ID, you're not, you know, smiling and sort of advertising yourself for the next employer to give you a high raise or something. There is a difference in those images. And so that was the point. I mean, this, the, these are the kinds of examples that we can teach people not to be intimidated by this new technology and all this fancy uh, quantitative tool sets that we, we can sort of teach students. And we go through examples. We put these case studies on, uh, on our website and on the class. And then also we point to other people that have done this kind of stuff. So we want to sort of remove that sort of intimidation. So the, 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 we have a lot of you know, sort of ways of teaching students um, things to look out for. And, and one of them is that extraordinary claims requires extraordinary evidence. Now, we had written that. And we, uh, we had talked with a lot of newspapers and, and people that um, had been following that particular story. And it wasn't long after, this was just last year, that a group at Stanford found a new set of algorithms that apparently could predict someone's sexual orientation by just looking at facial images. Now, this was written up in The Guardian. It was written even in The New York Times breathlessly. It was written in The Economist. And they, they talked more about the consequences and assumed as if 
they had developed a, a software that could actually do this. Now, Carl and I have all sorts of problems with this particular paper, and you can go, I don't have time because I want to get to some other material, but you can go to our website and you can read our response to this particular paper. But it's very similar to the previous paper that I just explained. We don't even need to get into the algorithms. We can just talk about, in this case, the data output. The original, the paper I just talked about was the data input. This is a, um, another example where sort of machine learning and AI is sort of getting a little bit out of control in, in, in what they're um, able to do. So I, I, I co-found and co-direct a uh, lab. It's called the Data Lab at the University of Washington. I'm in an information school, for so, so for you librarians out there, we work closely. We train librarians. We train um, data scientists. We train anywhere, anyone where it's sort of information is is sort of our unit of, uh, our, and data is our unit of analysis. And over the years that I, in, in, in running this lab and teaching classes and developing curricula at the University of Washington on data science, um, the one thing I have found with students, which sort of led to this BS course, is that they're really good at the mechanics of these things. If you give them, if you want them, if you want to have them find the Jacobian uh, of, a, of a transformation, they can execute that. If you, have, you want them to replicate a, an algorithm, they can code it. They can do these sorts of things quite well. But what they're not so good at is, is reasoning with their results and reasoning with that data and just stepping back from the mechanics. I, I sort of, uh, Carl and I hearken back to the time, you know, when, you know, the, the work that's being done in humanities classes, in a philosophy class, in an art history class, in sort of um, a literature class, where you, you know, when you, when you talk about, uh, when you talk about the symbolism of the birds and the Macbeth, you sort of, you spend all this time dissecting and, and, and reasoning with different aspects of, of the conversation and in the play. And, and I, want, I, want, I want to bring sort of this Macbethness to, um, to the world of data. Because really, underneath data, it, I haven't shown any fancy equations or algorithms. A lot of it, if we want to get at things like causation, which people do have a very hard time with, it's trying to come up with the kinds of manipulative experiments, thought experiments, that can help you disentangle correlation from causation. Because I'll start talking about this in the class, and you can see all the students there nodding their head, oh yes, correlation doesn't imply causation. They, they, they hear this over and over throughout their college experience. But when I test them on it, they struggle tremendously. Everyone does. It's a hard thing for humans in general. There's a bunch of interesting work in, 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 in psychology around why we struggle with sort of, um, sort of intuiting probabilities and statistics and causality and things like that. But this is what I want them to get to. So we run experiments in our lab all the time. And we might do something like this. Imagine that um, we want to figure out which fresh juice is sweeter from concentrate. We actually don't do this experiment. Well, that would be a fun experiment to do. There's lots of work in the area of nutrition. But let's just imagine that we were doing this. And I've get, I can give this question to students. And then I'll say, OK, what we're going to do is we're going we're to compare concentrate from fresh juice. We'll take 21 people for the fresh juice. We'll look at four people from the concentrate. And I'll even give you the results. Just assume that after doing this experiment, I run the experiment, I found that fresh juice actually is sweeter with a p-value of 0.001, the exact binomial test. But what's going on? Apples and oranges. All right, good job. I was going to make sure you guys were awake. I had to start with something that's good, although many times people don't see this one. So thank you for seeing that. Um, because I miss these things too sometimes. It's, it, we hear a lot of things every day. But yes, so I'm comparing apples and oranges. And we have all sorts of tips that we work through um, in this class, so tips for spotting BS, most importantly, tips for refuting BS. Because this isn't just a class on BS, because we do define it, we talk about ways of spotting, but we also talk a lot about refuting. So students always like an example. And they're, like I said at the beginning, we have no shortage of examples over the last many years, especially recently. Now, of course, there was this discussion by the Democrats and the Republicans, for whatever reason, got so caught up in how many people were at the inauguration. And there was this, this particular story that was written, said the media play the numbers game, and somehow conservatives always lose. The mainstream media has ignored the fact that eight times more people, eight times more people watched Trump's inauguration over streaming video than Obama's. 
I claim this is an apples to oranges. And why is that? If you go back, so if you look at the, 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 the let's just take the, the, what they're saying in this particular article as truth. And it, it could be very well that eight more times people were watching streaming. So let's go back to streaming video. If the, the charts that we could find only go back to about 2010, but you see this huge increase in streaming because the technology is available and people have access to that technology. And one of the sort of side notes that were kind of funny about this particular article, um, so, so the point here is that during Obama's time there was no even, you, you can't do this comparison because there was no streaming video essentially compared to what we have now um, during Obama's um, inauguration. Now again, whether there was more or less, who cares about that? It's just my point in finding these things is like, we need to be comparing apples to apples. But it was funny, this is just a side note. The funny part of this article, I had to put it in because it was just so funny. But the press left out some important differences. Most important, millions watched the inauguration on TV and streaming media, probably millions in Russia alone, <laughs> which was really funny. But the, the, the sort of thing that, um, the, the, the same, if you buy this argument, then also Trump must have had the zero carbon vote too and had more Teslas at his inauguration than Obama's original inauguration. Again, because of course, Teslas did not really exist at that particular time. But I do want to make a, a point here. The BS, of course, comes from all sides. And in our class, we, recently, we had one of the, the founders of Snopes um, come and talk to our class about the ways in which they do fact checking. And if you look at their database, we're working with them on some projects helping them uh, sort of increase their ability to, to get in front of the news faster. Um, and you know, there's the you know, FBI agent suspected in Hilly email leaks found dead. Of course, that was false. Snopes found that to be false. Um, Time Magazine reported that erroneously that the bust of um, Martin Luther King was taken away by Donald Trump. It was not. Um, that was not true, and Snopes sort of debunks these. But we use these examples, and we do, when we use political examples in class, we try to make sure that we, we show them from both sides, because they exist from both sides, and we don't want to alienate any students um, in our class. So it's very important for us to do that. Now, there's all sorts of other tips, too. I mean, if it's one of the ones that the students love more than anything, that's why I wanted to put this one up next, too, is if a claim seems too good to be true or too false, or too false to be true, it probably is. Students come up to me all the time before class and they come run, sometimes running, literally. I found something that sounds too good to be true. Let's check it out. And we check it out and they're, they're usually right. Now there's just one example recently, just this last year, MSNBC tweeted out during the discussion on immigration, which whether you agree or disagree with it, let's put that aside and let's just think about the content itself. It said here, the international student applications at American universities are down nearly 40%, survey shows. So your a couple things should be going off. It does sound too good to be true for something like that. And if you dig to the source like we tell our students to, if you go to the actual article where this happened, you find that it wasn't that the applications were down 40% in that short amount of time. It was that they were down at nearly 40% of the schools which is a much different story than being down 40%. And if you go to the actual report by the AACRAO, it's a long acronym, <laughs> um, you find that they were down at 39% of the schools, but up at 35% of the schools. So that's just a really um, sort of disingenuous way of reporting a story. And that doesn't do anyone any help in trying to get to the core sort of policy discussions around that particular topic. But this sort of game of telephone happens all the time. And using this as you know, one example, whoops, where we sort of, we see a lot of this nowadays and so much is coming, we don't have time to dig into everything. But we ask students to try to dig at least once a week into some article. And as you move back, you see that you know, original reports or scholarly articles start here. And of course, they can be laden with problems because of various reasons, most of them non-nefarious, but sometimes nefarious. They sort of land in uh, university press releases, which I, uh, Carl and I are sort of think that you know, science, uh, press, uh, scientists themselves can be complicit in sort of misreporting at press release time. Then you have visualizations and blogs and newspaper articles that are written about those. And then those things are tweeted. And just like the game of telephone, 
things sort of degrade and things, messages get changed. And so we want to create this culture, and this is something librarians have been talking about forever, sourcing your material. And try, we're using um, a lot of the work that's been done by librarians, teaching students and the general public how to properly source an article and, or, and how to, to compare two different information sources. And so this is sort of at its roots, librarianship. But something that is probably one of the hardest things to overcome for anyone as humans, humans in general, maybe robots will be less, oh, but they're not, they'll probably be even worse again uh, at avoiding confirmation bias. So let me give you an example. So confirmation bias is this idea that's been studied, well studied in the field of psychology, where when you see something that sort of fits your own narrative, it, you sort of, you can actually remember it more. You believe it, of course, and if you see it, you, you, you sort, of, um, sort of digest it and accept it much more easily than things that sort of go counter to your narrative. And that's really, really, really hard to overcome confirmation bias. And we don't have a great answers to that. But all we can say is let's all be aware, even us as academics and as librarians. Let me give you an example that got Carl and I earlier this year, just to admit. So Carl and I have done a lot of work looking at the gender representation in science. We've published on this. And we have found that, as you would expect, there's real problems, even today still, with equity between genders and, and, and race and all the, th the kinds of things that, that, um, that you, you would expect. And what we found is even the improvement that we've seen in gender representation, there are still major problems um, at the PI level and this leaky pipeline that exists. So when a tweet like this came from a colleague of ours, it said, shocked by differences in, in words for male versus female recommendation letters for faculty positions. Now, there have been some work that have shown differences in recommendation letters and in resumes by changing names, gender of names. And so this got retweeted and liked by many, many people. And when I saw it for the first time, I sort of assumed that that would be the case. If you look at these words here, so for female associated words, conscientious, dependable, meticulous, here it's more like fabulous, remarkable, extraordinary, very strong sort of um, responses. Well, deep down in these comments, a couple people had been saying, did you look at the actual article? So if you look at the actual article, this article, now there are articles that sort of counter some of these rules, but if you look at the article, it showed exactly the opposite. It said, Overall, the results of the current study revealed more similarity in the letters written for male and female job candidates than differences. Letters written for women included language was just as positive and placed equal emphasis on ability, according to this study. So what we were actually looking at, the image of our friend was actually showing the hypothesis and not the results. The hypothesis was getting sent around and getting tweeted by thousands of people and talked about, and people said, see? But even us, in the research area, we were victim of sort of not digging and also um, uh, sort of confirming some of our own biases. And, and again, that does not take away from the fact that there are differences. That's, that's what we've published about and, and talked about those differences. But in this case, we, we were caught as well. Now, there's really a lot of reasons for concern. And like I mentioned with that tweet from the Pakistani defense minister, they're really, I, I, I don't think it's too melodramatic to say that democracy is really at stake. And I think academia, librarians, educators, that's really the only way we can combat this. A lot of my technology friends think, oh, well, we can just improve the technology. Facebook can improve their platform. Google can improve their platform. We can come up with algorithms. You know, I hope they do. But I think the only way to combat this, this real epidemic we have in misinformation is to teach students. And the reason why we need to do it is because there's lots of disturbing kinds of things coming out. Um, this, was, this was done by, um, this, this was some good work that was done looking at, at BuzzFeed News, which is separate from what you know as sort of BuzzFeed itself. This is Craig Silverman did some great work. He's been doing some good work looking at sort of false engage, or engagements with false news on Facebook. And if you look at before the election, you find that fake news, people engaged more with, according to this, this study, and we'd need to look into it further, but according, if we buy this study, people were engaging with fake, more fake news stories on, on Facebook prior to the election than non-fake news. And that was comparing the 19 mainstream news items that were landing on Facebook. They got 
data to this. So that's disturbing. What's also disturbing to me are the ways in which falsehoods, even purposeful falsehoods from the, the research literature, are spreading and being reported in the news. So this was recently happened. BMJ did their, they did one of their um, end of the year kind of funny um, additions where they just sort of make up something. And so they claimed that men complain more about the flu and cold. And this spread like crazy. It was written in all these major news outlets that you would imagine are, are sort of quality news outlets. And they made it clear it was not a true thing, but this passed and was written as if it was true. So if this kind of thing can happen, imagine things that we're, we don't even know for sure are absolutely fake. Of course, all the, this, this news that's coming out of Facebook now, looking at the influence that um, uh, some of the propaganda, you know, some of the foreign adversaries, and not just Russia, but of course Russia is sort of the centerpiece of this response, you know, 126 million. Uh, Facebook alone, where uh, they now have a, a tool that allows you to see um, what you were exposed to in this in this this material that was being spread around. Um, so you know, Facebook and I've been to a few meetings where Facebook and Google seem to be wanting to do something, and I think they are, but I think they are way behind. And we're seeing this not just in sort of tweets; we're seeing this um, at like an individual level. So, so people like Jenna Abrams, who is supposedly this sort of canonical American girl talking about the Kardashians and putting out jokes, every once in a while would put in very divisive comments. And they and it found out that this person that had tens of thousands of users and was even written up in some news places, she was someone that was just being run um, by, uh, by a Russian organization just to sort of be divisive. Like, look sort of true look like she, what she was saying was true and sort of, sort of tip, you know, a, a normal American. So there's investment not just on the algorithmic side, but on the people side. To do this, you would need people to run this persona. Um, now, of course, there's economic incentives. The, this, the kids, in the, the teenagers in Valus, Macedonia, who have made tons of money by creating fake news. They're sort of this fake news factory. There's a bunch of interesting go at work there, but that's reasons for concerns. Other things that really concern me is beyond, it goes beyond just fake news. It's the fake comments and the stolen identities around things like the net neutrality and, and um, all the things that go along. So there's lots. I could go on and on and on about things that we really actually should be concerned about. And actually, if you, one of the most important principles in BS studies is something that uh, Albert Brandolini put out. It's called uh, the bullshit asymmetry principle. And that is the amount of energy necessary to refute BS is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. And that, you know, there's been many, many examples where this asymmetry principle has worked its way into mainstream. But of course, Pizzagate was the most famous example of this. Um, where Edgar Welch, who was doing what he thought was right, he really believed that there was a pedophile ring being run by Hillary Clinton in this um, pizzeria in Washington, D.C. He got in his truck, got his gun, he drove there, and he blasted his way in. Now, fortunately, no one was hurt, um, but this shows the impact, of course, of fake news. And even after this refutation, and even after Alex Jones himself uh, apologized for it and said that it was fake news, there were still protests on the White House lawn earlier last year claiming that this was even a larger cover-up now that Alex Jones had apologized for it. So these, these sort of asymmetry principles come back again and again. Jonathan Swift, I like this particular quote, falsehood lies and the, or flies and the, and the truth comes limping after it. And if there's, a, there's all these great asymmetry principles. Uh, you know, some are about effort, some are about, but here's another one. An idiot can create more bullshit than you could hope to refute. Um, so what's, you know, what's going on? There's all sorts of things that, uh, there's been great work that's being done in research on what's going on. I'm just going to mention sort of one, um, just quickly, because I want to get to a few more examples and then leave enough time for some questions. Um, so the, the one thing that I think um, is partly driving, in addition to just the sort of behavior and the way that social media is set up, and also um, sort of the, the sort of current state of affairs, um, you know, the, the issues themselves around sort of our digital environments. There's all sorts of ex things that are going on, but I think this idea of tribal epistemology is, I think, is a pretty uh, at least one um, sort of part of that explanation of what's going on. That is that tribal epistemology is that what's more important for me 
in what I know is not necessarily based on the sort of typical ways of knowing the world, like evidence, uh, empirical um, uh, evidence, but, but by whether it helps the tribe or not. And, and people sometimes will share false information, um, not because they even think it's true or false, but because it's a signal that I'm a part of the tribe. And this is a real problem. It's been talked about by Judith Donath at MIT Media Labs. And sort of this is sort of her explanation, which I thought was, this is pretty good. Carl and I both think this is a pretty good way of sort of explaining some of what we're seeing, that in the world of social media, news is shared not just to inform or even to persuade. It is used as a marker of identity, a way to proclaim an affinity with a particular community. So it's, it's a signal. That signal is more important uh, than, than actually the information itself. And you know, also, you know, another thing, of course, that is what is likely driving a lot of this is this movement, in least um, from these, uh, at least in the news area, this movement away from gatekeepers of information, like that editor that would pass it down to the associate editor, et cetera, through these subscription-based models, where you would have this long time to sort of filter out what you were going to report and what you weren't were going to report, to this sort of click-driven. Um, sort of model, which, uh, the, you know, the, I've talked a lot with uh, people from journalism, and they're, they're certainly well aware of it, but coming up with a solution is not trivial. Um, but all of us, we're humans. Like, we're, this is, this is sort of the stuff that we see on the side of our news, and when you're driven by things like, there's something hidden in the Hershey's logo, and it'll rock your world. It promises you this experience. Or it's like, you know, seven cats that look like Robert De Niro. I mean, I'm totally, I'm totally, um, uh, they can, that, that can totally get me to click too. I mean, this is, this is, you know, that, this is like tapping into sort of really basic human, um, human response. So th this competing in this click-driven world and the models that are, dri the, that are built that are sort of facilitating this are sort of uh, uh, competing with this. So really the point here is that the unvarnished truth is no longer good enough. But there are some reasons for optimism. So there's, uh, you know, just even a couple days ago, uh, Macron, uh, the French president, had mentioned that they're going to announce some fake news laws. Now I will say it's positive because leaders of the world are caring about this enough to at least bring it to the forefront. But a law like this does scare me a little bit. There was a proposed law in the state of California. And if you care, if you care about uh, this amendment, the, the First Amendment, um, then you know, we don't want to degrade, we don't want to degrade this with laws. This could be a slippery slope to laws that sort of, um, you know, sort of degrade that really important principle. So in some, I'm sort of torn on this. I'm glad that leaders are thinking about it, but I'm also concerned a little bit about downstream effects of these kinds of laws. Even though, of course, I'd love to get rid of all the fake news, I'm, I don't know if a fake news law is going to solve that. It could make things worse. Now, we do have fact-checking organizations, and I think students are starting to use these more. They're becoming aware of them. There's more and more fact-checking organization. And this is really tough to be a fact-checking organization because they have to be careful what money they take, what they report on, they have to be apolitical. It's, really, it's a really difficult thing. In my state of Washington, we're one of the first states. You know, we're doing a lot, some things right and some things wrong. But one of the things I think we're doing right is that the state of Washington is now requiring in secondary ed um, having some sort of um, media literacy cor uh, course, or it's requiring media literacy, basically. There's a bunch of great work, um, at least in the data science world, even though I think they're going to be a small portion of the solution. There's these, a lot of people working on ways to detect when, like a newspaper article, for example, where the headline completely conflicts the actual core message, although it's a very hard machine learning, um, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do. You know, I think you know, the, our government, uh, the Congress, is talking about um, you know, some of the problems that we've seen on social media. Facebook, Google, they are doing things there. I don't think enough. I wish they'd be a little more transparent. But at least they are doing some things. You know, even the word of the year, people are paying attention. Um, it was you know, post-truth. So it's, this isn't sort of flying under the rug. People do. So there are some reasons to be optimistic. And also, um, this was a graphic built by a high schooler from New Orleans that sent to Carl and I. And uh, her, she and her set of classmates created a graphic um, 
that sort of ex explained sort of the reliability of information in their opinion. Now, I, 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 we had a nice discussion about why Wikipedia was all the way down here, um, but the, it was, it's good to see that high schoolers even are responding to this sort of thing. So what I'll do is I'm going to end now just with a, a couple examples from the most common way of displaying data and manipulating arguments, and that's through data graphics. And, and we need to be more careful. This is one thing where we get a lot of bang for our buck. So when we talk in our class about some of these statistical traps, that takes time to sort of sink in with students, and it takes practice. But graphics we're seeing all over the place. All of our newspapers, you know, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, all of the newspapers, the best newspapers around the world are getting, you know, throwing more and more uh, infographics, interactive infographics, really sophisticated, very gorgeous figures. But they can also lead to misinterpretation. And there's, you know, there has been this rise of charts in general in newspapers over the last 30, 40 years. But we also have to be always careful with cumulative plots, though, as an example. Um, so one of the cumulative plots that you'll see in sales meetings all the time, which Tim Cook showed, um, he showed a, the, the sort of cumulative iPhone sales, this explosive growth. But does anyone see the problem here? The problem is all cumulative plots go up. They never go down. <laughs> So when you use cumulative plots to show that, the more accurate way, which I thought was reported pretty nicely, if you actually looked at quarterly sales in iPhones, Tim Cook, uh, he certainly has a little bit more to worry about here than this explosive growth. So beware. I mean, there's lots of things to beware. So cumulative plots. We go, Carl and I go through many, many, many things to watch out for graphics. Here's another one. So Canadians um, and the the sort of non quebecois and the, the rest of Canada have this quibble about trust. And um, if you know much about Canadians, this is a, is a big deal. But there was this, this nice, or not nice, nice example of what not to do, um, of uh, use of bar charts where they were trying to show, look at the differences in trust, people in general and the rest of Canada. But what's the problem here? Sorry? Yeah, they just sort of cut it off. And you can make two differences look as big as you want if you keep sort of zooming up. So it's a kind of an unfair way of looking. If you actually add up the pixels and you count the area, and actually we do this. We take rulers and we count. We say, if you're trying to convey a quantitative argument, it needs to be proportional to the amount of ink that you're showing the individual. We call it the principle of proportional ink. We have a little nice method or uh, uh, sort of uh, case study and tool set that's written on the website about the principle of proportional ink. A more accurate way to do this and tells a different story is reporting it like this. Now the other thing we see a lot of and misused a lot of are multiple axes. So if you look at this, um, this looks as if there's a tight, rel or, uh, a tight relationship between MMR coverage in the UK and the prevalence of AD. But of course, what had happened, this was a clever use of zooming in, zooming out until they matched up perfectly. If you actually used the zero, which you should be using in this case, you see a much different story. Now, there are times when you don't necessarily have to use the zero, and that's with line plots, and I'll explain that in just a second. But you can do all sorts of things. This was a famous plot, very controversial plot, that had been manipulated. Who, who like? It, this breaks all sorts of conventions. Putting negative 10, you just shift it far enough down so it, it, it lines up. Now, I see these, these we, we have things called ducks and glass slippers that exist where we sort of create the duck image. This is something that Tufty and others have talked a lot about, rather than really conveying quantitative arguments. So if you look at this, 27 and 820 are very big differences, but it's hard to tell when you look at them in this way. Again, violating the principle of proportional ink here. We see these fan, love, people love these sort of uh, circular plots. But the problem here is that if, if this is looking at um, the arable land per acre for these different countries, and here's the number that you're going after. So you're essentially looking at a bar plot. But if you have to travel around a circle to go to the same spot, there's going to be a lot more ink that's devoted to the outside edges. We know this in running races. You want to be on the inside if you want to win. And that's not fair. That's not a very fair way of looking at that plot. And it can be so misleading if people look at these. And you know, a lot of times they're easy to catch if you just look at the graph for a few minutes. But if you get a quick look and you only get a, just see things 
for a very short amount of time, which most of us do because we see so much information, we have to be careful of these things. Now, of course, the famous three-dimensional pie chart, I see these all the time. Um, and again, it's violating this principle of proportional ink because look how much ink that was devoted to making it three-dimensional. So the Android gets all this extra ink and effort in campaigning. Now let me show you the last, or, or the, the most uh, important graph you'll need to see according to the National Review around climate change. And that is, if you look for the last several hundred so on, some odd years, you see a really flat line. But of course, if you zoom out far enough, you're going to see a flat line. You can create a flat line in any way. Um, if you actually zoom in using this, this is data from NASA. Um, and you zoom in, in this case, it's OK to zoom in because you're using a line plot, not a bar plot. You can actually see that we do see um, the actual trend of a, about a change of two degrees and something we should care about. But my favorite way of responding to these kinds of gra graphs is something called reductio ad absurdum. And my favorite reductio ad absurdum of that original graph was done by Bloomberg, where an individual took time on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, so the same exact variable. And if you zoom, in, zoom out far enough, you can show that time actually does not march forward. <laughs> because you can zoom far enough out there that it looks like a flat line, even when you have time on the x-axis and time, and you should see time you know, going uh, along the diagonal. You can zoom out and you can show that time doesn't exist. But let me show you the last one here. So there was a lot of controversy about the Florida Stand Your Ground Law. Now there's great debates, uh, there's, uh, it's, it's okay to have debates about a policy, um, about the pros and cons of whether the Stand Your Ground Law was going to be effective or not. And looking at the number of deaths that occurred after the law was instated and the deaths that were before. And you can do, again, we can go back to the Macbeth arguments, and you can talk about um, all the different ways the data could be interpreted, and that's OK. But creating graphs like this, anyone see the problem with this downturn in deaths? It's upside down. So another convention that's been around for about two millennia, um, where we put zeros on the, 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 the x-axis, Instead of the, it looking like it goes down, it actually the deaths went up. Now again, there, it could have been time lags, could have been whatever. Um, it's not necessarily that we're, I'm making an argument for or against the law. All I'm saying is, let's be careful about how we convey our quantitative data. And that we have, we have basically limitless numbers of examples. And so graphs, are, I think, are a really great, I mean, we should just all, as citizens of information, uh, information consumers, we should be really, really good at di uh, digesting graphs. And the only way to do that is to practice it and to look for these kinds of problems. And I would say this, most of them are not on purpose. Even this one here, you may think this was being nefarious. But this particular author, after there were some discussions with the author, um, she, I, I, I actually think that she wasn't trying to be uh, manipulative. She said she wanted to build a graph with blood dripping down. And so instead of worrying about the blood dripping down, we should probably think about conveying the quantitative data um, uh, more. We can convey that better than before. So let me just, sorry, oops, sorry. I just want to end this la with this last slide. Sorry. I wish I had time to talk about the dead salmon, because it's one of my favorite. Um, OK, so here's what I want to end with. If you get some, one thing out of this particular um, talk, it's this, that um, I think we can do a good job of teaching the public how to call BS in general, and specifically on data. And everyone sort of sometimes feels a little bit dour about all the misinformation. But I do say that there is, there is some fake news out there that's actually good. And I'll give you an example of something I learned earlier this year about Taylor Swift. <laughs> so Taylor Swift, I found, had, after all these different people she'd been dating, she, would, she was now dating Senator Joseph McCarthy. But we do have fact checkers out there, thank goodness. The user uh, right here says, I really hope you realize this is fake. This dude died more than 50 years ago. And oh, thank God, because I was going to seriously throw out the CDs in the, the bin. So there is some things that can be a nice reprieve from all the fake news that we have. So thanks for listening. You can follow us on Twitter. We send out stuff, uh, Facebook, and you can email us anytime. You can go to callingbull.org 
if you want to see some of our current content. So thanks for listening. Yes, thanks, sir. I just want to grab the microphone. Does anybody have any questions for Jevin? We have just a few minutes. We went a little over on time, and I want to yes. make sure that we... Uh, I'm happy to answer questions great. now or after. It looks like your question right there. Feel free to come up to me afterwards, too. Hey, I've got a question. Is this on? Yeah, it sounds okay, like it. Good deal. So uh, a lot of what, what we do is teach the public how to critically evaluate science in the news, um, particularly like health information. Yes, health information is the number one sort of uh, uh, sort of problem where we had um, fake news stuff. You know, I saw you had one of your, your slides was cited with the, the Health News Watch, which is a fantastic resource, but they have a huge panel of like editors that contribute their time to critically evaluate these articles. Yeah. And the challenge that I have is I can teach the public, like my mom, <laughs> my aunt, how to source, Me too. Uh, source the stuff, you know, find out which publication this came from. Um, but the critical evaluation of the scholarly article seems to be where I run into a lot of trouble. You know, when we start talking about statistics, people really lose confidence. What other tools are there out there that I could use? Well, you're, so thank you for asking that question. That is the core of what we're trying to do in this class. Now we're so, so ramping up slowly. It's to, to remove the intimidation that people have because of all those statistics. Now, there's no way we could teach a class. We'd need to teach multiple years to the same people to really give you all the tools that you need to disentangle. But well, the way we want to start is say, OK, forget the statistics. Let's just look at the data that was used in the experiment, and let's look at the interpretation and believe the statistics. Let's just believe that it was significant. The other thing you can do is there's great statisticians now that are reaching out to the public. And you can sort of point to those. We do need to rely on our experts in the field, too. It's talking to people. But having case studies, I find so effective to getting people to practice sort of dissecting it. And, and there'll be times when they'll, even through the case study, they won't fully understand how the algorithm or how the multinomial regression was used or, or even know what a Bonferroni correction is. They won't know that. That's OK. But if they get more and more case studies to see where the flaws were, and I claim that a lot of the flaws are not in the statistical, not the running of the script in R or you know, any statistics package. It's in the interpretation of that data and also the input. So what I'm doing right now is saying, OK, let's forget about the actual statistics. Believe that that part was run right. Let's focus on the data input, the claims that are made. How would you gather that data? How would you interpret the results that are, uh, that are sort of coming from the paper? So, but it's just engagement. And we need to have case studies that are fun and engaging and and, and, and I, I feel bad because some of, the, <laughs> some of the authors of these don't make purposeful mistakes, and then they become the case study. So we do reach out to the individuals, and we say, we're going to use yours as a case study. Did you want to respond to it? And, and they're usually all, all, always open. And people make mistakes. We say, attack the content, not the person. But anyway, to answer your question, I think it's going to take years for us to do this. I hope we get more statistics education in high school. Um, so that that doesn't become intimidating. But I agree with you. Library, I, I went and talked with the, the Science Writers Association. And these are science writers. They engage with science every day. And then two things that they asked me is they said, first of all, how do I evaluate all these new journals coming out? How do I know which journals are good and which aren't? They cared about that. And then they're like, statistics. How do I interpret a p-value? How do I interpret whether they've done an ordinary least squares correctly? Or, and you, at this point, I say, you don't need to do that. Spend more time on the, the data input. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? There's a question back there. So my question is about how much or how little in the class do you spend talking about the different outlets? Right, because some of the basic challenges here is people don't use Twitter to yeah. communicate a nuanced story, right? We're like the New York Times is going to care more about that. So does that factor into your discussion of the data you're looking at? So now let me just make sure I got your question correctly. You're saying so, you know, some people have never used Facebook ever. Some people use it a ton. Some people use Snapchat. Some people don't. Is that just the the, the lens in which you no, take well, in the information? I'm more, I'm more so. It's more about the intent of the stories you're looking at or the medium people are using. Like Twitter, if I use Twitter, I'm not using Twitter as a journalist. I might post repost something, but 
I don't have a responsibility necessarily to my readers to give them accurate information. It's just what I choose to post. I see. Or like the New York Times, that's part of their responsibility. That's their profession. Right. They have to go through that whole rubric of fact checking and, and they have a different process by which they deliver that information. That's a great, it's a great question. Um, so uh, we do talk about it. Um, I, I, do, I think we could obviously talk about it more. One thing that we, we say um, about this, you, because you know, it's not just the limit of 140 characters that you have, it's, it's the ways in which things can propagate really quickly in these certain platforms like Twitter. You can sort of move things so fast um, because of you know, the way that information passes in these social networks that we have to sort of you know, jump on these things quickly or they, they start to cascade and you know, just the spread, the ways, you know, the limits and how we uh, pass that information, just like what you're saying, you know, you're, you're just saying something maybe off the cuff because you're, you're going to lunch and you're like, oh, I'll, I'll tweet this out real quick and you don't take that care that you would if you were going to publish an article. But there are people that that's where they consume information. One of the things that I've talked to students about, especially high school students, I, one thing I'm very curious about is who, where do you get your information? And it comes across the board. Like, although it's crazy, they're already, you know, Facebook's like archaic to them now. They're like, oh, Snapchat and all these other kinds of things that I barely know how to use. Um, they, they use those as their main form of communicate or of getting their news. Very few students say, yeah, I go straight to the Wall Street Journal or I go straight to New York Times or whatever. They go all over the place. Um, and so, yeah, that makes it more difficult to figure out how to capture it. But it's a, it's a good question. I don't have a great answer of, of, um, uh, of how to um, articulate that yet, but hopefully we'll learn. Yeah. Thank you all. I really, um, I, I hate to cut question time short, but I want to give you all a chance to refill your coffee um, over in the Food for Thought before our um, first round of concurrent sessions start. Remember, those are in 1140 and 1022. Uh, so uh, check your schedules, and if you have any questions, um, I'm here. And uh, thank you so much for yeah, attending. Yeah, thanks for thank coming. Thank you so yes. much, Devin. Yes, yes, it's thanks, been Sarah. Great having yes, you. yes, thanks. And um, thanks a lot.